I want you to think of your favorite video game, like actually do it. Now imagine if we replaced all of its ugly graphics with just text. Now it's way better, right? Well, I wrote a game engine that's capable of doing exactly that in just a week. Or that's at least how long I thought it would take. <laughs> it, it, it didn't, it didn't. Now first, for all you non-game devs, what actually is a game engine? Well, you've probably heard of Unity or Unreal. Or <coughs> my engine, if you're actually watching this far enough into the future. But really, a game engine is just the tool to help you make a game faster. And of course, better. They'll include a lot of pre-made things like maybe an editor or physics system. You know, a bunch of random crashes. Some engines like mine are code only, which means that they're really just interacted through, well, code. While others have full built-in visual editors like Unity or Unreal. But I kind of want to finish my engine before I die, so I decided to just stick with code only. And I'm also using C-sharp because I like it. But so I started by opening up Rider and made a new C-sharp console application. The engine takes place in a terminal window because literally all you can do in a terminal is write text, which I think is pretty cool. And wow, look, now we have ourselves a terminal window. But there's this really annoying thing in the console called quick edit mode that's enabled by default. It's there so that you can quickly select and deselect text on the screen. But I don't really want the user to be able to do that when there's a game running. So I did a quick Google search to figure out how to disable it. And unfortunately found that it's actually not possible to do with C-sharp or so I thought. But first, get some cookies and milk because I'm gonna tell a story. Back in the day before C Sharp, people would write a lot of programs with C and C++. Then we had the creation of C Sharp. Obviously C and C++ have their advantages, but C Sharp is arguably easier to use. So Microsoft gave C Sharp the ability to interop with C and C++, which basically means that I can call into C and C++ code using C Sharp, which means that in my C Sharp program, I can call into the Windows API, which is written in C, which gives me a lot more things that I can do. For example, disable quick edit mode. The issue is a lot of data types that are in C aren't actually in C Sharp. So somehow we have to find their equivalents. Which brings me to the sponsor of this video, Nobody. Just kidding. A huge thank you to fellow YouTuber Mental Checkpoint for sponsoring this video. For those of you that don't know, Mental Checkpoint is a game development YouTube channel that exists simply to show you what makes some games successful and others not. One video I'd like to highlight is his one on marketing an indie game to success. The ideas he presents in the video are incredibly useful to me as a game developer, and everything from the overpolished editing to the little jokes in between just make the whole video a really enjoyable experience. I've been a fan of the channel for a really long time, and you'll be too when you start watching, so go click the link in the description or pinned comment or wherever I put it. And thanks again to Mental Checkpoint for sponsoring this video. I eventually found this website called Pinvoke.net. Pinvoke stands for Platform Invoke, which literally just means we interact with C and C++. The website looks like something a 10 year old made, but it's full of a ton of valuable information. I then was able to disable quick edit mode, which made things way better. And with my newfound knowledge, resize the window and change the font both using Pinvo. But that's boring and you don't care, so I'm gonna move on to something more interesting. The game loop. It's literally not a game engine without a core game loop. The game loop just updates the game every frame. A really, really simplified version is just an infinite loop that ticks and then renders. But there's no cap to this infinite loop, so it'll just keep doing more work than it actually needs to. The human eye can't really see the difference between anything above 60 FPS. So having our frame rates in the thousands is just wasting resources. Instead, I wrote a simple game loop that caps at 60 FPS. And now I can have game objects that will update every single frame. So we can actually like, do stuff. Okay, so a game loop is cool and all, but it's not really a game if the user can't actually control stuff. And for that, we need keyboard inputs, which of course isn't super easy to do. In C Sharp, there's this method called console.readkey, which blocks everything until we actually press the key. Great for a turn-based game, but not really for like, you know, other games. So I did some searching on pinfolk.net and eventually found out that I could do it with well, pinvoke. I had to hard code this really big enum with all the values for the keys. And then I wrote a quick input manager to interact with all these external methods. So I guess we're done. Thanks for watching and have a great day. I decided that after that, I would move on to rendering. Somehow I need to be able to take images and display them as text in a terminal window. And then I remembered that images are made of pixels. So if I just get a bunch of square characters, then I can pretty much print out any image that I want. But of course, because nothing can ever be easy, the console only supports 16 colors. That is, at least if if you're not a genius like I am. I found this one by two rectangular character with a dithered pattern. And if we set the foreground and background to different colors, then from far away, it looks like they mix together, which now gives us 130 unique colors. But this is a really slow process, so I can't really do that when the user is about to play the game. And so I decided to make a custom file format with all of those conversions already done for me. And of course, a sprite editor to go with it.
I started by making a new Unity project because, you know, it, it's easy. I then found all of the RGB values for the console colors online. Next, we just find every possible combination of those 16 colors. That gives us 136 different combinations, but six of them are duplicates. For example, black plus white is gray, and gray is already a color, and etc. I then slapped them on a little sidebar, then I added painting, erasing, color picking, all, all that good stuff. And finally, to export, we just take the texture that we've painted on, loop through all of its pixels, and round it to the closest color of the 130 that we generate. Then we just write that data to a file, and we're done. With the sprite editor finished, I quickly drew an example sprite that I could use for the render. <coughs> Sorry. Back in Nate Engine, which, by the way, is what I'm calling it if you hadn't gathered, my first order of business was to make a parser for Nate Sprite files, which, by the way, is what I'm calling the Sprite Editor if you hadn't gathered. This took a lot of code, and it quickly began to confuse me because, I don't know, maybe I'm just, like, dumb. Nothing seemed to work, and I don't know what I did because this was like six months ago, but somehow I got something on the screen. As you can see, it's really slow, and you can see all of the pixels being written one by one because it's just that slow. But at this point, it's basically up there with Unity and Unreal, so I released it to the public and became a millionaire. So yeah, thanks for watching, and have a great day. Okay, so obviously this looks kind of bad. So I flipped it, moved it, stretched it, and now it looks a lot less bad. And with some optimizations to the rendering, it was still really, really slow, but it was definitely something better that I could actually work off of. Yay! So now basically we have everything we need to make a game with this engine. But Nate, what if our game has levels? Scene Management a scene basically acts like a level, or a menu, but y you get the gist. The idea is that each scene is just a bunch of game objects being spawned in, and when a new scene gets loaded, we destroy all of the game objects in the old scene, and of course spawn in the new one. Initially, I had the user create a .scenes file, and then the game would look for that, but it was really tedious to type everything out in the file, and it was really prone to errors because you could spell something wrong or put it in the wrong place. So instead, I just had the user pass them in when they start the application. Now, the sprite that I drew for testing is, um, uh, good. But I'm not about to make an entire game with it. So instead, I decided to draw some more sprites for a sample game. But A, I realized that I'm a bad artist. And B, I didn't really want to use Nate's sprite because it wasn't really that good. And, you know, great minds think alike, so I figured other artists wouldn't want to use a mediocre sprite editor either. So I killed Nate's sprite and replaced it with Nate's sprite converter. All the tool does is imports an image, loops through all of its pixels, and then converts the colors like before and then exports it as an 8 sprite file. So now developers can use other art programs if they want, or even steal someone else's art like I was going to do. So I found this really cool art pack on itch.io, converted all of the sprites, added some gravity and an animator, a simple player controller, and then some tiles with colliders, and now we sort of have a platformer. I then wanted to move on to something really, really important, but first I had some stuff to take care of. First off, having the window like it is right now is really inconvenient. Like, we can't move it, we can't close it, we, we can't really do a whole lot with it. But the reason I have it the way it is, is because I don't want the user to be able to resize it. And you might be wondering, Nate, why don't you want the window to be resizable? Luckily, I eventually found out that I could change the window styles with Pinvo. Okay, so like I hinted to before, converting each individual image to an 8 sprite file is really tedious. So ideally, I'd rather have them just as their normal image files. But again, like I said earlier, it's really slow to do this in the engine. And I was ready to give up on the whole notion of doing that when I found something that completely changed everything. <laughs> Now, that's a lot of big words, so what actually are they? In short, there are basically two ways of interacting with the console in C. Either we can do the traditional way, which is just to call a bunch of methods, or we can use the more modern way, which is just us writing these things called escape sequences to the console. Notice how that if we write this, it doesn't actually show up on the screen, but instead what it does is change some kind of property in the console. This is great because most operating systems support virtual terminal sequences, as opposed to stuff in the Windows API, which is obviously only supported on Windows. The other great thing about this is that it gives the Windows console the ability to display full RGB, which means that I ended up killing the Nate Sprite converter as well as just the Nate Sprite file format in general. So now we can just import regular image files and everyone's happy. And when I say everyone's happy, I especially mean me because this also made rendering way faster. But then it all fell apart. Sort of. I realized that the code was really bad and interacting with the engine was kind of also bad. So I rewrote the entire thing and then realized that I had completely over-engineered it so then I rewrote it a second time and then I was happy with the code quality. The engine was now actually fun to work with and all that I needed to do was make sure that I could actually handle an entire game. 
I had the platformer that I made before, but it wasn't actually rendering very many pixels because most of the screen was just blank. So I grabbed this really nice art pack from itch.io and tried to put it to the test, and it wouldn't even run. The thing with this art pack is that art took up the entire screen, meaning that the entire screen is being re-rendered. And no matter how much I optimized it, I still couldn't get it past the point of like not showing anything. So I thought to myself, you know what? This isn't going to be a game engine in the terminal anymore. Tune in next time to see me make this into an actual like viable game engine.